Welcome. Uh, this is session 6C, Collecting Signals Intelligence, or SIGINT. Um, I, we're going to hear today from uh, three individuals, Mr. Gabe Marshall, Early Remote SIGINT Collection, a foretaste of today's mission operations, Mr. Mark Borgerson, USS Sphinx, the last special project ship, and Mr. Darnell Washington, the sub-detection system you probably didn't hear about. The full bios and abstracts of their presentations are available in the attendee packet that you received with the final program. Uh, all questions may be submitted via the Q&A chat box um, throughout the presentation, but we'll leave all of the questions to the end. Um, and I will uh, read the questions off to the um, speakers so that they can respond. So if you could please put in uh, your question, which speaker uh, you are directing your question at, that would help out a lot. Um, and any questions we don't get to, we'll send out uh, to the speakers afterwards and hopefully can get some information for you. So first up uh, is Mr. Gabe Marshall. Hey, thanks a lot, Gabe Marshall, coming to you from San Antonio, Texas on my iPad and from my residence. My boss was kind enough to let me off this afternoon to do this because I can't do this from a skiff because we don't have cameras on our Nippernet computers in the skiff. So this is why I'm doing this from home on my iPad. I could have even used my kid's huge gaming machine, but he works for the VA, so he's gainfully and gamefully employed today. So next slide, please. All right, there's my introduction slide. You can see that a foretaste of today's mission operations is done in purple. I did that for a reason, and you'll probably see that a little bit later. Next slide, please. So this uh, presentation has been security checked and OPSEC checked to ensure that it doesn't contain classified information and that it's been sanitized. Um, so I'm only going to allude to some events and I'm going to be very general about events and capabilities to include some program names and I'm not going to allude to to real real specific things even target countries and and that sort of thing so we don't want to get anybody in trouble we don't want to jeopardize anything going on today in the intelligence community or to any third party operation next slide please so going back and looking at remote SIGINT collection and specifically wideband collection, NSA was interested in this technology from the early 1950s. You might ask yourself why? Well, the ugly American syndrome was already rearing its head. Um, NSA and, and the US military and DOD in general didn't really want a large, uh, large footprint in certain countries. Um, Germany with the U.S. Army was one thing, Japan, that was one thing. But to have Americans doing things that were probably looking a little bit shady with antennas and, and closed doors and buildings with no windows, that could have caused um, political issues as well. So political considerations and reducing overseas manning was one of the things that NSA looked like looked at in starting remote collection. And you also got to look at technology at the time. The transistor was just over 10 years old. So you could start to do a lot of things, um, particularly with recording and reproducing signals. So that was that that was an important consideration as well. Now the United States Air Force Security Service or USOFIS was involved from the get-go in that early effort. And detachment one of the 6940 security wing at Goodfellow started the first wideband tape processing test way back in December of 1960, which predates me. And that went till April of 1961. They resumed wideband readout activity July 1961 and continue those on a limited basis until July 1963. And USAFIS actually stood up a unit, the 6945th Security Squadron at Goodfellow um, to take on wideband readout and expanded signal recovery efforts. Overseas wideband uh, collection and maturity was initially conducted at a USAFIS location in 1964. And I might add that the Navy and the Army also had other remote operations going at the same time. Next slide, please. 
Let's look at some of the tools, the primary tool for wideband collection. And that, of course, is the AN Flare 9. Now, I know there was a presentation earlier on the last Flare 9. I didn't get to see that. But the Flare 9 was the primary high frequency collection tool of, of the SIGINT community from about 1964 through to 2015, if I'm not mistaken. So it's got a long and storied history. It's an omnidirectional antenna. 1 to 6, 6 to 18, and 18 to 30 megahertz frequency range. This is a picture of a Flare 9 at an overseas USAFIS location. Actually, the Army um, owned this particular antenna. So that was the focus of some of the products that were collected um, for the first USAFIS effort in wideband. Next slide, please. So what we've got here is early wide, early on wideband collection was quite limited. NSA, of course, and the services had a large budget to develop collection and retrieval systems. Um, and it concentrated on a very narrow portion. You couldn't go one to one to three. You had, we basically had to start from three to 30 or, or, or target the three to 30 megahertz uh, spectrum in HF. It was called remote RF environment and the technology developed slow, slowly, and initially you could only collect about between 1 to 1.8 megahertz. So magnetic tape recordings were made on a set schedule to capture non-perishable signals. I stress non-perishable because these were targets that the SIGINT community wanted to make sure were doing the same things they were always doing, that they were using the same signal operating instructions, their call signs and frequencies were changing as predicted um, and that they were doing the same sorts of things that their subordinations did not change. So the tapes were reconstructed in CONUS using special equipment. So they were recorded at the overseas location and then they came back um, via ARFCOS, Armed, Force, Armed Forces uh, Courier Service, or even sometimes commercial air, hard to believe. And processing and exploitation recurred at the recovery activity. Next slide, please. So here is a linguist um, at the 6993rd with a KSR, which predates the old GGC 15s. And we see that this linguist, probably from about 1975 to 1978, has a recorder running. So, long story short, even though these playbacks occurred in two hour act increments, they were recording the recordings because you could still miss things even the third time around. Pretty interesting. I, I, I thought that was um, not strange, but I could see why that, that PT6 recorder was on that old, um, old uh, manual collection rack uh, when I started to go through the photo archive. Next slide, please. So here we see the um, USAFIS effort in all of this, the 6993rd Security Squadron also known as Remote Intercept Recovery, Recovery Activity Kelly, or RIRAC, activated on 1 April 1967. So to backtrack for just a second, USAFIS was involved in this for several years with NSA. The Air Force and NSA worked pretty well together. It was originally, the 6993rd SS, was originally subordinated to the Air Force Special Communications Center. It had a large squadron footprint. Today, this, the Air Force Special Communications Center is the 688th Cyberspace Wing. So you've got 725 airmen, 11 officers, and one civilian all um, undergoing, um, doing this remote mission out at Kelly. Um, and the unit was the largest of the three services remote organizations. Let's look at their, their pads for a minute. You can see that they allude to their mission there with those tape, uh, those tape reels. Of course, the scroll doesn't really tell you too much, but you can see they sort of have a unique mission. Next slide, please. So I've covered some of this stuff already um, and what it was. It didn't actually occur right at the headquarters use office. They had to build a new building out at the Medina Annex, and that's probably about eight miles as the crow flies from my house. It's, it's that way. Um, I'd say, <laughs> and the Alamo is that way by about 20 miles. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly close. I'm within 10 minutes of the old Medina regional of the old Medina annex. So let's look at that in the next slide, please. 
OK, um, that'd be the next slide. But here's the activation order. I felt I felt obligated to uh, to take a picture of this so you could see that Usafis was well ahead of the game. The order was cut on November 18th, 1966, almost what five, six months before official unit activation. The unit manpower document or UMD was formulate, formulated. And let me tell you, even today, it takes a long time to come up with a UMD. In fact, our own 16th Air Force UMD isn't even finalized yet. So next slide, please. So here is a view of the Medina Regional, uh, or of the uh, RIRAC out at the uh, Medina Annex and the 300 area complex. That brings back a lot of memories for me. You can see in the in the far background there the 300 area and then to your right further back before the fence line is that building that was constructed for RIRAC itself and the 6993rd security squadron. Next slide please. Here is the entry control point or EC or ECP at the 6990 6993rd security squadron in about the mid 1970s. Looks a lot there like it does outside today. It's uh, 92 degrees on my patio right now. So, um, and we're, we might break a record a record high here in the next couple of days, but uh, I tend to think it felt just a little bit cooler out there. There's a few more clouds around today. Uh, oh, well, uh, that day than there were, than there is today. Next slide, please. I like black and white pictures too, so you can see that headquarters building here in the front. And take note of this, the CSOC, or the Consolidated Security Operations Center, 6993rd Security Squadron, U.S. Army Field Station, San Antonio. So that takes us into our next slide. This is about circa 1974. Next slide. Okay, this is the orderly room on Security Hill. This dorm is since been uh, demolished, um, but you can see, I think the guy, one, a couple of the airmen there, he had a, he had a broom or a rake, but uh, it was interesting. The 93rd with a large squadron footprint had um, a lot of stuff going on. A lot of manpower was necessary, um, even in the support role from a logistical standpoint to maintain the recorders and the other equipment necessary to put on a, uh, remote mission. Next slide, please. So as I said, maintenance was a big thing. This is the uh, maintenance control facility. You can imagine a number of things would have to be PMI, everything from teletypes to tape recorders to receivers because the receivers were manually tuned. You would roll up on a signal. They had the target information, whether it be Morse or voice. You would roll up on the signal and you would still have to tune it off that tape um, to be able to acquire it, much like you were at a live intercept site. I wasn't manually tuning the receiver after about 1988. Um, NSA had something they called CSU. Next slide, please. So what we've got here, we've got a, an airman um, doing some maintenance on a little more modern equipment there at the um, at then the CSOC. This is from the mid 1980s for sure. You can see it's a CRT tube. I tend to think it's probably a uh, uh, a reporting terminal, maybe Parsec or something like that. So next slide, please. And same thing you've got here. You've got this is one from the from the mid 1970s. This is an airman doing reporting. Still, they had to do reports, even though they were recovering. They were recovering information from uh, non perishable sources. They still had to report that stuff. The thing about the SIGIN community during the Cold War is redundancy. We forget about that. Um, the HF frequency spectrum just had a large factor of redundancy built in um, in the Cold War. Next slide, please. Let's look a little bit at the unit lineage of the 6993rd. It became the 6993rd Electronic Security Squadron on 1 April 1979. And at that point, it was subordinate directly to ESC headquarters uh, in the mid 70s. So next slide, please. So here um, I'm showing you a couple of other things. Um, go back one, please. Thank you. Um, the picture on the on the left there, 
he's got an old GGC 15, but yet he's tuning Raycal's. Um, that is at the 93rd. So Raycal's did go in from about the mid 1980s. And there in the center picture, you see an analyst doing some reporting, um, probably of key recoveries or, or other uh, SOIs. And then on the right, of course, you see another analyst um, doing some other analytical things. Next slide, please. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the CSOC. So the CSOC was the first time that we know of that it combined the efforts of the Army and the Air Force, Field Station San Antonio and the Air Force's 6993rd Security Squadron as an integral part of the worldwide U.S. communications network. So CSOC, when it activated on July 70, 9, uh, 1 July 1974 at Medina, was that unique unit. Here's a little bit about its unclassified mission, 24-hour tactical and strategic combat information processing and reporting to U.S. Southern Command and NCAs. Remember, Central America was already heating up, and we actually had a lot of stuff going on from a military standpoint, both covertly and overtly in Central America by that time. They developed and applied techniques and materials designed to secure and protect friendly C2. They advised U.S. and allied commanders concerning procedures and techniques that could counter the bad guys C2. And they provided communication support to U.S. aircraft. Um, all important things. And of course, they always did research into electronic phenomena. Next slide, please. So here's um here's my basic sign from the 80s. You can see the Army and the the, and the Air Force were out there. Um, I actually got a briefing on the wideband mission way back in 1984. Hard to believe that's 38 years ago. I remember a lot of it. I have to push some of it out of my head, but I also had to refresh myself on a lot of it. But um, as far as icons and innovations are is concerned, this was very innovative when it started in 1967. I would submit to you that probably by the mid 1980s, it was very mainstream, but it was already looking at what was coming next. Next slide, please. So the CSOC closed in the immediate uh, post Cold War period on one August 19 or in August of 1993. And it was replaced by the Medina Regional SIGIN Operations Center, or the MRSOC. Um, that's what the cryptologic centers were called before they were called cryptologic centers. So it was the first of several RSOC to be RSOCs to begin operations. That was a big deal. Um, NSA came here because water and water was cheap, and it was cheap to cut the grass in San Antonio. General Hayden later paid um, Sony Semiconductor. I think he paid $30 million for that tract of land where NSA Texas sits now. I'm not going to say where it is, but I'm just going to say it's that way. Or is it that way? Yeah, that's more, more east. Yeah, the sun comes up over there. It's east of here. So let's look at all the, the units that were there. Just look at the, the squadron patch of the 93rd Intelligence Squadron. We're looking at the Marine Support Company H, the Naval uh, Security Group Activity Medina was there. Um, and I also threw in the uh, field station San Antonio and the, one of the first RSOC coins that were there. So that's why it's a purple suit organization. What began as a wideband mission with just an Air Force unit evolved added the army and later became purple suit and we know why because the cold war fell and u.s uh in the u.s intelligence community and our whole structure sort of it, it had to it had to reboot next slide please so this here this here is sort of a farewell this is taken in the 80s i was stationed at the 6948th ess which would be to the bottom left of this and you can see that old building still at uh, at Medina. It hadn't been replaced yet by the new building that replaced, or that they began operations when the MR SOC stood up. Next slide, please. So um, here is CSU equipment. NSA spent an enormous amount of money upgrading that stuff, and CSU or the conventional signals upgrade went in at the at the at the uh, CSOC as well. The old IBM XTs, the old um, 
old CRTs, monochrome monitors. Back when a keyboard uh, cost $800 and a monitor cost $2,500, and, and who knows what a CPU cost at that point. I, I would shudder to think NSA probably paid about five grand. Um, so that was very, very expensive. You could get four or five good gaming systems now for that. Next slide, please. Show you a little bit about the lineage of uh, the 93rd that it was redesignated the uh, 60, but the 93rd IS on 1 October 1993 when the Air Intelligence Command became the Air Intelligence Agency. And then later on in a few years, on 1 March 1997, the 543rd Intelligence Group activated because of the expansion of the mission. Naval Security Group was there. Um, had a huge footprint of about 600, 700 sailors, I think, not to mention all the Air Force people that were there as the Air Force host. You can see some uh, reporting and some collection going on with the old, old, older equipment. Um, you can see some maintenance stuff going on there as well. So next slide, please. These are, are these are ground linguists um, at the at the MR SOC, well, not the MR SOC, it's actually, yeah, this is the MR SOC in 1998, 25 years ago. They're, they're, they're dealing with this old equipment. This has since been replaced. I had a floor tour there in about 2003, I think. That's almost 20 years ago. Next slide, please. I want to show you the, a little bit of the, the, the maintenance footprint that went on. You can see these um, NCOs here, these airmen are checking on some equipment. Awful lot of equipment had to be checked and calibrated and maintained, um, and it, it was a big deal. Next slide, please. Shows a little bit more of that. Shows um, them checking the parabolic antennas back when you could put an antenna out in the open. I don't think they do that anymore, and you can see some more maintenance. So next slide, please. Talk a little bit about this um, 69, about the 93rd. It's got a rich history, several outstanding unit awards and a Combat V device from June of 2001 to May of 2003. Doesn't take um, a great scientist to figure out that we're involved, we were involved in the global war on terrorism. So next slide, please. Another shot of maintenance. Um, yeah, I guess they use static mats too, because you got to be really careful. You don't want to shock yourself. Next slide, please. You can truly see it's a purple suit organization. You can see the Navy in the background and the Air Force in the foreground. One airman wearing his blues, and it's a staged picture, but very much an office-like environment. Next slide, please. Here's a modern view. You can see um, when that building was built at the MR SOC in the early 90s. So you can see it expanded quite a lot before it moved. Next slide, please. Ninety third moved to a new home that was in 2012. I'm not going to say where this is. This is now NSA Texas or the Moretti Cryptologic Center. The technology and the uh, just the vastness of it is absolutely incredible. Uh, it's huge. Next slide, please. So here's what we wish we could have. I remember this flood. Fortunately, I didn't work, work there then, but all the development caused those people to lose their vehicles. And when, back in 2007, the last time we didn't have a 100 degree uh, summer, so. I, I I heard about that, but a picture is worth a thousand words. You didn't have to suffer it. So next slide, please. So real quick, um, to do my conclusion, NSA developed wideband technology for the collection of intelligence information at overseas site, overseas sites. USAFIS took the lead. It conducted the first tests of the capability. It matured it. RIRAC stood up, it hosted the first joint service unit with CSOC in the early 70s. It opened the first purple suit organization almost 20, 30 years ago, and it paved the way for other regional activities and reached back. That concept, of course, by the end of the 2020, the 2010s reach back and NSA regional concept was entrenched. Next slide, please. 
So I've done this in just about 22 minutes and 40 seconds. So thanks for your time. Please hold your questions till the conclusion of section of session six. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next up will be uh, Mark Borgerson. Emmett. Just a second, Mark, you're um, you're muted. Let us get you unmuted. Don't let us. Mark, can you hear me? Um, you need to unmute yourself. I, am I good now? You are good, yes. OK. Thank the, you. The button was small and my eyes are old. <laughs> OK, well, I'm Mark Borgerson, and the subject of this presentation is the USS Sphinx, the last special project ship. The special project fleet was a group of World War II vintage ships that were converted to collect signal intelligence for the Naval Security Group and the NSA. Next slide, please. OK, I'm trying to get my script. There we are. There were 12 ships in the special project fleet. Six of these ships were converted Liberty or Victory ships of about 450 foot length. And they were operational mostly in the early 1960s. The best known of these is the USS Liberty. Two of the ships, the Valdez and the Robinson, were converted medium cargo ships of about 339 feet in length. The Valdez remained in service for nine years, the longest of any of the fleet. The three smallest ships were the Banner, Pueblo, and Palm Beach. These were converted coastal freighters of about 180 feet in length and were originally built for the U.S. Army Transportation Command. The USS Pueblo, of course, is the best known of these. Actually, in 1975, I spent about three weeks on board a sister ship of the Pueblo off the Oregon coast. It was a rough ride, but not nearly as rough as the ride off the North Korean coast. Note that the last three ships before the Sphinx in the table have the USNS designation, meaning that they were operated by civilian crews from the Military Sea Left Command. The Sphinx was converted in 1985, about 15 years after the Valdez was decommissioned. Next slide, please. The USS Sphinx, um, oops, I'm out of sync there. The USS Sphinx was launched in November of 1944 at the Hingham Shipyard in Hingham, Massachusetts. It was converted directly after launching to a landing craft repair ship. It repaired minesweepers in Japan in late 1945. It also participated in Operation Crossroads in nuclear testing in the South Pacific in 1946. In 1947, it was transferred to the reserve fleet in the Pacific Northwest. During the Korean War, it was recommissioned to repair fleet units in Japan. And it served in Vietnam from 1968 to 1971, where she received, where she received, excuse me, she repaired riverine patrol boats and other small craft. The Sphinx earned eight campaign stars in Vietnam, as well as a Navy unit commendation and a presidential unit citation. In 1971, she was placed in the reserve fleet in Bremerton, Washington, and she was stricken from the Naval Register in 1977, then reacquired in 1985. Next slide, please. Effective SIGINT collection requires some sort of knowledge of the uh, target identities, operating frequencies, and networks and the Sphinx didn't have to go into its operations in the Central American region to start from scratch. There was previous NSG detachments, Naval Security Group detachments, aboard destroyers and frigates in Operation Jittery Prop between 1983 and 1985. And there was SIGINT collection by a group from the U.S. Army Intelligence Support Agency in Central America also. 
Next slide, please. Some of the incentives for the activation of the Sphinx were primarily a more, more cost-effective platform for the jittery prop surveillance activities. And you can see there's a quote here from um, an evil war college thesis telling about how um, jittery prop was organized and came about and that they were conducting uh, electronic surveillance in the Gulf of Fonseca between Nicaragua and El Salvador. And the vessels in that operation monitored shipping and probe shore surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. Not only could the Sphinx provide a larger ship signal exploitation space or SAS, she had satellite communications capability and specialized antennas. She was also less expensive to operate than the frigates or destroyers and she consumed less fuel per day and could stay on station longer with uh, lower cost. Next, next slide, please. The second conversion of the Sphinx was completed in early to mid-1985. And here's a little quote from the Washington Post showing that, you know, it wasn't exactly a, a big secret at the time. The Navy did uh, press releases about it and they were picked up and published in the Post. And they did say that the Navy maintained a frigate or destroyer in international waters near Nicaragua for most of the last two years. In fact, many of the CTs that later worked on the Sphinx had participated in those operations. Next slide, please. Okay, the, second, the sailors from the cryptologic division of the Sphinx were actual participants in the design and installation of the ship signal exploitation space. Uh, incidentally, I have to thank Gabe for his presentation because a lot of the equipment that they probably had on the Sphinx looks a lot like the stuff Gabe was showing us from the mid-1980s. So you can use your imaginations to decide how this compartment might have looked on the inside. It was a new, completely new compartment of 24 by 35 feet, and it was forward of the radio room and aft the newly installed helicopter landing pad. There was an antenna mast, mast near the bow, bow with multiple UHF and VHF antennas for SIGINT collection. Two UHF satellite communications antennas were also mounted, and they allowed direct high-speed communications back and forth to NSA in the Washington, D.C. area. Next slide, please. This is a picture of the boat deck, or the 01 deck, is Navy parlance, above the one above the main deck. And it shows the radio room, the captain's cabin, captain's state room, radio central and repair and radar workshops. And there's two compartments just forward of the radio room, which were probably ship's library and other storage, and were not directly accessible from the radio room. Next slide, please. Here's the deck plan after this, and there, the deck plan is pretty much from my imagination and some descriptions of the area from uh, CTs who served aboard, and I'll get to another source later. As you can see, the new CES directly in front of the radio room was quite large even compared to the radio room. Uh, along the right or starboard side were four radio telephone intercept positions. In the middle were a group of desks for the division officer, leading chief petty officer, and one of the communicators. Over on the port side, there was a maintenance bench and storage racks for a lot of the equipment that had to be maintained and Thank goodness Gabe gave us some pictures of maintaining that kind of equipment. So you can use your imaginations again there. Next slide, please. The cryptologic division on the Sphinx was detailed in the commissioning booklet for the ship. And they had a division officer, lieutenant, and a leading chief petty officer, uh, chief communications technician in interpretive branch. There were five CTI linguists, one senior analyst, the CTI-1, and the two operators for each section uh, of the watch, so a total of five. 
There are four CTO communicators that maintain the teletype equipment or the communications equipment, the encryption gear and stuff like that, and handle message traffic to and from the interested parties on the other end of the line. And they had two CTM maintenance technicians to maintain all this gear. There was also a CTA-1 administrative specialist. He handled things like ordering key cards, making sure that supplies were online, handled the clearance and briefing of new arrivals, that sort of thing. Basic senior office technician. The enlisted assignments to the Sphinx were considered arduous duty and filled by volunteers. The sea tours were counted as double sea duty and for just were for just one year. After the tour, the sailors got more freedom to choose their next assignment. Next slide, please. Here's a picture that was in the or the commissioning booklet for the Sphinx, and it shows the cryptologic division the uh, senior chief, the officer in charge was listed amongst the officers and on a different page. And there's pictures of the CTs, uh, usual ratio of mustaches to non mustaches among CTs at the time. And it listed the uh, crew in the commissioning booklet, which was not usually the case for most ships. Uh, they were commissioned without an integral uh, cryptologic division and received their cryptologists on temporary duty from other stations. Next slide, please. Well, here's the general operating area. As Gabe said, things started heating up in Central America well before the arrival of the Sphinx. And the US was established in the middle of a little spat between El Salvador and Nicaragua. Uh, US had a base at Sotocano in Honduras and operated in the Gulf of Fonseca, which was directly between the two off the, on the coast there. There were some references in the command history reports to temporary detachments that served aboard the Sphinx for things like maritime interdiction and stuff like that. But those got pretty well redacted out of the command history reports that I received. On the Caribbean side of the Panama Peninsula, or Isthmus of Panama, was the naval security activity at Goleta Island. This was an FRD-10 direction finding station. It was unique in that it was part of both the Pacific and the Atlantic Navy high frequency direction finding nets. It also had a good large number of uh, interpretive branch CTs or linguists, and of course, a very good high frequency antenna system. That may be the reason that there were no high frequency uh, collection positions aboard the Sphinx. One of the uh, CTs aboard the Sphinx made his teammates a bit jealous. His wife was a CT stationed at Goleta Island. So when the ship would come into Panama for liberty, his, ar his arduous duty was a little less arduous than that of the other CTs. Next slide, please. Here's a little close up of the Gulf of Fonseca. And you can see that for a ship sitting in the middle of that Gulf, uh, they were within the 15 nautical mile circle of quite a bit of the coastal and maritime activities that might happen between the two countries. There was also a Marine Corps manned radar station at Tiger Island, which is right at the north end of that, pretty much under the O in Union, La Union El Salvador. La Union was one of the port calls early on in the Sphinx operations, but its references were redacted in the command history reports, but showed up in a later magazine article. I suspect that um, it got removed from the active port calls because of either diplomatic considerations or simply operational considerations. All the later port calls and refueling stops got moved up to uh, Puerto Quetzal. Next slide, please. Living aboard the Sphinx for the CTs and the rest of the crew was pretty normal for a small to medium sized naval ship of this type. The enlisted CTs all shared a 12 man berthing compartment. I suppose that was, as legend goes, to keep them from the, spouting any classified details if they talked in their sleep. 
Air conditioning was adequate in the birthing and mess decks, but the cess was chilly, as is quite often the case in compartments that need a lot of air conditioning to cool the electronics. Apparently the food was okay, but as is often the case, they lacked fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables after about a week at sea. The watch schedule for the CTs varied depending on the preference of the leading chief petty officer. The 12 on 12 off for CTIs and CTOs, the senior CTO analyst serving an extended day watch. The CTAs and CTMs were on day watches. They had an eight hour day in E watches with three CTI and two CTO in each watch. They worked for maintenance decks, senior analyst, and LCPO. And this varied from year to year depending on the preference of the leading chief petty officer. Next slide, please. Well, on any ship engaged in this kind of operation, which is basically sailing around in a racetrack course about eight miles wide for days and weeks on a time, can present some morale and leadership issues. Uh, the morale and leadership was considered very good by one of the senior CTIs in the first crew between 85 to 86. On the second year, I heard reports that there was a lot of short timer attitude and that can be a real problem when you have a one year tour and you're already looking forward to a choice of a duty station, you know, maybe hitting for Britain or Germany or Hawaii. And those morale and leadership issues can be infectious in a small crew with very sort of harsh and boring working or off duty conditions. And a small division also makes it difficult to swap out personalities if a couple of the CTs don't get along with each other. Next slide, please. There were a few pluses and minus in the whole leadership and morale issue. And they did get mail and spare parts. Uh, the spare parts probably of most interest to the maintenance stacks. And they were delivered by Army helicopters from San Ocado. Uh, in its first year, the sink spent over 200 landing tests or had over 200 landing tests by non-Navy helicopters as they trained Army helicopter pilots for maritime operations. They had Liberty calls in port. About every four to six weeks, they would get to shore. The ship would fill the fuel tanks and restore food supplies. But there were limited opportunities for recreation, apparently, in La Union, but there were more in Puerto Quetzal and even more in Panama. Of course, CTIs or linguists on liberty were often given free drinks by their shipmates in return for negotiating the best price for local goods and services. With a bit of initiative, the CTs would often tune in a local language program. They could log as language skills training and they would add some music and stuff into the mix. Since the uh, Sphinx didn't have high frequency intercept stations, they had to rely on local uh, VHF and UHF, and I'm not sure how much there was available in terms of music and language in the FM bands at that point. They had limited recreational facilities aboard the ship. It had no gym, it had no big lounging area, uh, there was, of course, the goat locker, the chief petty officer's uh, lounge, but the sailors themselves had no real recreation facilities except for going to a ship's movie e every evening in the mess decks. And of course, there you're sitting on very uncomfortable plastic chairs and uh, wasn't quite the best of operations or best of morale builders there. Next slide, please. The operations tempo was pretty intense for the jittery prop vessels. Because as I, men as I mentioned, they had to train and qualify Army helicopter pilots for mar maritime operations. They got some mail and other things. They are redacted references to the tem temporary de detachments. And there are a couple sources that mention operations with SEAL teams, but there's nothing really official about that, and there probably won't be. About 60% of 1996 and 1997 was spent on patrol collecting SIGINT, their primary mission. 
The operations specialist aboard also kept track of maritime traffic using radar and visual observation. They had their monthly calls for fuel and supplies at La Union, Rodman Naval Station, and Puerto Quetzal after about 35 to 45 days on patrol. And the Sphinx was replaced on station by a frigate or destroyer for longer maintenance intervals. Some of the CTs on board the Sphinx would cross deck to the naval frigate to carry on their operations. Next slide, please. Here's a calendar view of the operational tempo color coded. So hopefully, even if you have red green problems, you'll be able to figure it out here. Training was pretty intense immediately after they left Bremerton and headed down to San Diego where they did a lot of operational training. And this was primarily for the, the crew that had to operate the ship. Uh, the CTs, many had been doing the same mission aboard destroyers and frigates, so they were pretty well tuned in. You can see the blue operational periods in October and November, and a lot of that was involved with the helicopter pilot training. That was, excuse me, that, the blue was the in transit from San Diego, which took about a week to a week and a half, and then they went to Rodman and then back to the op area. The operational periods in the December through May time frame of 1986 were pretty intense, and there's no listed port calls in the uh, command history reports. And I found that a bit strange, but then I guessed and it probably has to do the, with the fact that the port calls were in La, Reun La Union, El Salvador, and they were eliminated out of sensitivity to diplomatic or other considerations. There was an in-transit period and a long yard period between May, June, and July of 1986. The Sphinx developed some severe problems with the drive shaft on one of the propellers and it needed maintenance in a lot of other ways. So they ended up doing a transit through the canal and to Charleston, South, Car South Carolina, where they spent about four weeks in the shipyard straightening out these issues, making some other repairs, adding lights, antennas, and things of that sort. Then there was an in-transit period back to uh, in this case, Guantanamo Naval Station there, where they went through operational evaluation and to make sure that everything that had been done in the shipyard was holding up. Um, some of the CTs who had avoided that because they were on the frigates were the subject of a bit of jealousy by the ones who had to go through an extended evaluation and training period off Guantanamo. Then toward the end of the year, they were back to normal operations. And that continued with a short yard period in 1987, a longer yard period in 1907, and then a much longer yard period in 1987. Most of those occurring at uh, Rodman Naval Station in Panama. They, so they only managed about 60% on-site availability during that year because of these maintenance intervals. Next slide, please. Now there's wasn't very much information on that uh, previous slide about 1988 and 1989. Uh, I could not get uh, command history reports from the Naval Her History and Heritage Command because they didn't have them. They requested them from the National Archives and Records Administration, but they didn't get them before this presentation. And that's probably due to COVID impacts on retrieval of records at NARA. A whole number.com a reference um, available on the internet has two references to equator crossing ceremonies that I found very interesting in February of 1988. Uh, they crossed the equator going south and then going north about a week later. And that leads me to conclude that they were going south toward Columbia and then heading back north, but there are no declassified records on that. And there's no further records until the transit to decommissioning in June of 1989. Next slide, please. 
Why were these missing months in the record? Well, a lot of things happened in South America and Central America in the last years of 19, the 1980s. Of course, we can look forward a, a year or two and know that the Soviet Union was falling apart at that time. But earlier on before that, the Reagan White House drafted a National Security Decision Directive 221 declaring the international drug trade was a threat to U.S. national security. And that had the effect that they could use Department of Defense assets to support drug, counter drug operations. And the things, of course, had trained linguists and the ability to carry out such operations. And they also have had a reduced requirement in the Gulf of Fonseca because there was a Central American peace treaty signed in the fall of 1987. And then, of course, there were tensions in the Panama area that were leading up to Operation Just Cause to depose Manuel Noriega, which occurred in 1990, I believe. So all of these things probably sort of cloud the uh, unclassified records of the Sphinx at that time. Next slide, please. Well, the Sphinx in 1989 was in transit and then decommissioned at Norfolk Naval Station in June of 1989. It was transferred to the James River Reserve Fleet on June 15th of 1990, and then transferred to the Dunkirk Historical Lighthouse and Veterans Park Museum in Dunkirk, New York, which is on the shores of Lake Erie. And that happened in 2002. Of course, by that time, all of the cryptologic equipment on the ship had been removed and returned to warehouses are dispersed to other stations. Due to a lack of funding on the part of the museum, custody reverted to the Maritime Administration in April of 2007. And the Sphinx was finally sold for scrap in December of 2007. Although even the scrapping yards had a problem, they went out of business and got cycled from one shipyard to another for scrapping. A rather ignominious end to a proud ship from World War II. Next slide, please. I derived a lot of my information about the layout of the CES and the antennas and layout of the Sphinx from a model that was built by Tom Hathaway. Tom was an Army Reserve officer and he visited the Sphinx when it was in Panama in the 1980s. His research was aided by a walk around video taken by a chief petty officer aboard the Sphinx. And that's why you can see the Good detail in the UHF and VHF antennas at the in the forward mast. If you look on the after part of the ship and on the top of the wheelhouse, you can see the uh, antennas for the SHF or UHF satellite communications. And of course, you have the layout of the, the CES running almost the full width of the ship. In a little more detailed photos from Tom's uh, model building, you can even see where there were 50 caliber gun mounts on the top of the cess and i suppose it got rather noisy in the cess when those got test fired the ship also retained its two quad 40 millimeter mounts on the forward and aft ends of the ship and those and a couple of sailors trained in the operation of stingers helped provide some security or feelings of security for the sailors on the sphinx who of course didn't want to repeat any of the uh occurrences that happened with the liberty or the pueblo and there's a Kitmaker Network website that shows in great detail all of the hand work that Tom went through to build this model. Uh, I have received some notices which I forwarded to Tom from uh, Bremerton Naval Museum that they might like to have this ship. I'd like to have that model. <laughs> My, yeah, and if I was aboard the Sphinx, I would certainly want to have that model. Next slide, please. Well, this is the last of the memories of the Sphinx. Uh, there is an active Facebook page for the USS Sphinx. It has reunion schedules, notes about former crew members, in which helped me locate some of the people I interviewed for this presentation. And it's got some photos submitted by former crew members. And this was probably something taken by a CT from the top of the CES as the local flight in-flight entertainment arrived, bringing both mail and parts, I suppose. Uh, they used quite a variety of different helicopters uh, 
flying in and out of Honduras to resupply the sinks. That's pretty much it. The history of the last of the special project ships from World War II to be engaged in SIGINT operations. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mark. And we're gonna, uh, Darnell, you're gonna run your own slides, right? Okay. Okay, let's turn on mute. Mute and send them live. You gotta shoot, you gotta switch to Darnell. Oh, you want me to? Yeah, I'm trying to. Right. Darnell, um, we can't hear you. No, we still got you muted. Can you? Trying to get. Okay. I think he has to unmute himself. Can you unmute yourself? For some reason, we're having trouble. Yeah, it's not letting me unmute. Just a sec. Am I unmuted now? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And can you see my slide deck? Because I'm going to start sharing. Can you see my content? Uh, no. Not, no, let's try this. Okay. I cannot see your content. Yeah, I'm going to share my content. Here we go. Okay. And it shows that I am presenting. I'm not sure if you can see me now. Okay. And if you can't, then I think you guys have a copy of my slide deck and we might okay. just take it from there. Okay. Are you able to see my slide deck? We see the slide deck. We need him to call himself to add his picture to the. Uh, okay, to I'm gonna. Content line. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because we still have. Do you want to just send him line, or do you want to just do it? I, I mean, Darnell, I can I can run yours if you want me to. Okay, yeah. that'll be fine. Okay. okay. So let me. Uh, just give us a sec. Okay. We will make sure that you no. have your full time. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this will be fun. Yeah, it's not letting me switch off of me. How can I help? Do you want me to? Um, do no, it's fine. I got it because it's. Being Henri this afternoon. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, I know what it is. Okay. That's what it is. Okay. Hey That's guys, me. one of the issues we may have if we have a problem with the audio, it was okay. uh, important to say use computer sound. If that okay. doesn't work, let's just bypass the sound if you can't hear it appropriately, okay? okay. Yep, we can hear it. You're, no, you're good. Just, I can see the video slide. On number four. Yep. Okay. We're good. OK, well, oh. first off, thank you very much. My name is Darnell Washington, and I'm welcome to the SIGINT sector for the National Cryptologic History of Anti-Submarine Warfare. Um, the colleagues that with the previous presentations, they all seem to point out a lot of the challenges about actually being on board of a ship and sometimes the morale and certain issues that came over. But what we're here to talk about really is we're going to talk about the submarine system and what we called it is a sub detection system you probably didn't hear about with no pun intended. My presentation is about approximately 20 minutes and then a the moderator as we had discussed had asked for us to hold the questions until the end. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, on this slide, this basically speaks to uh, Scientific American uh, magazine, which was very popular back in the day, they wanted to really start talking about something that when we first, when people first saw the um, area of how can you detect a sub if you can't see it or if you don't use sonar. So sonar was really the only solution that people would think that America and the allies, as well as the adversaries, had as a toolkit for being able to detect submarines. However, the things and when you're talking about non-acoustic detection of submarines, first to prelude is that water is a very efficient mechanism to hear. There's a lot of, lot of noise and a lot of ambient noise that you might hear 
on land and in air based applications, but in water, the sound is very easy and it's a water is a very efficient way to send sound and sound waves for a long period of time. As well as some of the other in instances that we have here that submarines have inherent capabilities and that one of the wet mechanisms that they use for sonar was to deploy hydrophones in areas to try to determine the position of subs. Next slide. In attribution of the history of icons and innovation, much credit has to be given to a gentleman by the name of Dave Bushnell. He was known as the father of submarine mines and also the inventor of the torpedo. So this device, which is here, is known as the turtle. And the turtle was designed to be able to sneak up on an enemy ship where they could then deploy mines and to deploy different levels of explosives and incendiaries to destroy enemy ships. So I would think that if we started talking about anti-submarine warfare, if one of these uh, devices tried to creep up onto your ship, even back in the day, it would have been very difficult to detect. Next slide. So some of the great moments in submarine, modern submarine history and in submarine history is that the building of a submersible war sub is probably one of the greatest accomplishments in history. As far as because of its stealth and the amount of ingenuity to withstand the things as far as to go underwater with deep pressure, how to manufacture, to design and to test underwater vessels, and also the resources that were required to being able to build, to design and to even be able to test these were testaments to modern history and even the ability of how the Navy went to build nuclear reactors that could actually work with submarines where they moved from SSBN, which was submarine nuclear capabilities, to other systems were first credited to the first U.S. nuclear powered sub, and that was the U.S. Nautilus SSN 571. Next slide. So as well as with all great successes that we have in history, we also have had not so great moments in history. When this ship, which is called the Stickleback, the Stickleback, I'm sorry, was actually rammed by a new US Navy ship. And what they were trying to do was they were trying to test and they not only had gas leaks and different kinds of issues, but collisions among subs were one of the greatest levels of uh, security detriments that caused us not so great moments. And when a submarine uh, is destroyed or has a collision, they consider it staff to be on eternal patrol. OK, so let's go to the next slide. Um, on slide number six, I just wanted to start talking about the importance of anti-submarine warfare, sub detection and mechanisms for being able to detect subs. Most of it is concerning about stealth lethality and the capability of SSBN capabilities in their warheads. Uh, like it said, one submarine can level 288 city-sized targets into radioactive ash in less than 30 minutes. So one of the uh, areas that I put in my synopsis was that the world as we know it could be destroyed in less time than it took to order a pizza. The Office of Naval Intelligence uh, said that an, a Russian sub or an adversarial sub that's within 124 miles can uh, strike a U.S. target within 12 minutes. So then as you start thinking about the criticality and what that each warhead has guidance systems that are accurate to less than a football field, then we actually have to think that because they're always prepared, always on alert, and they're very stealth, give uh, the requirement to maintain an actual submarine force that's always prepared, very important and critical to the US mission. Next slide. So in today, with the ongoing active conflicts, and with we call SSBN or boomers, we have to talk about how uh, the adversaries are beginning to test new weapons, 
they are considering independent nuclear forces to each of the countries that are on our adversarial list are starting to develop nuclear capabilities. And we're starting to get to an ominous trend where strategic nuclear competition is occurring on a daily basis amongst first world countries and the requirement to us always to stay on top has been an essential capability for what we're doing. So as we start moving forward, let's go to the next slide. We all talk about the nuclear deterrence being a part and being a very real thing. We know that we have the ability to create mission mutual assured dis destruction and also that the collection of the nuclear weapons have enough lethality to end the world as we know it. So let's go on to slide number nine. Next slide. Um, again, we're talking about history repeats itself. And as we start talking about nuclear detection being more of a cat and mouse game, the intelligence of anti-submarine warfare and the standard mechanisms to detect these submarines using hydrophones and those areas are becoming more prominent. But however, the ability to make less noisy submarines and to create silent submarines and to being able to have evasive ways to disrupt or apply countermeasures to anti-submarine detection is one of those areas that is always um, under development. Next slide. So this here is a slide. I'm not sure if it's actually going to play and whether everyone can hear it, but let's go ahead and to play it. And if it doesn't play and we can't hear it, we'll go on to the next slide. OK, we'll go on to the next slide, but this basic. Oh, there it goes. We hear it now. Um, this base, this slide, I'll basically talk through it before we go through, but they're talking about how important anti-submarine and sub detection is in this area. But let's just go on to the next slide because it's not actually giving us everything that we want here. OK, so now we're going to start getting into the sub detection system that you probably didn't hear about. The kinds of sonar and mechanisms that they currently have were both known as active and passive submarine detection systems. What happens is that the active sonar sonar is where you have to have a specific signature where you're bouncing the sound waves off the objects and then re determining the time that it takes to come back versus what's known as the passive where you're deploying hydrophones that sit stationary and you're just listening and recording to find the evidence of sub detection. Next slide. Submarines have the ability to launch missiles that can threaten critical infrastructures in our nations. Submarines are inherently stealthy. You can't see them when they're submerged. So how are you going to find a submarine? One of the primary ways we do this is with acoustics. And so we are listening for submarines underwater. This is very difficult because submarines are extremely quiet. And this is a, uh, a very slow process that requires intense concentration. So when we are looking for submarine, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. So the first thing to do is use, for example, a uh, maritime patrol aircraft with its radar. So when a submarine is uh, surfacing, we directly detect it. The advantage of a maritime patrol aircraft doing anti-submarine warfare is we have the capability to react very quickly. We can deploy sensors in just a short time to focus on high-speed subs or on low-speed subs more proactive than a frigate does it. Strategically, it's very important for NATO that we have the ability to neutralize any threats from below the sea. Okay, we can now go on to slide. Yes, now 
this is our first entry into determining uh, what we have as far as for signals intelligence for non acoustic mechanisms. And what we're going to talk about as far as from a technical introduction is that without having the direct observation, we look at levels which are actually called fluidics. And you have waves that you might see in the ocean as far as where they gravitate toward the, the sea and the shore and you can see them hump. But also as ships pass, there are different things which are called lateral waves and there's actual called traverse wakes. And what happens is that in water and objects move through water, the wakes are comprised of these areas. Uh, next slide. When we talk about the process of how getting out of the object's way, what happens is that the water, depending upon how much propulsion or how much inertia is behind the object, it actually provides the process of how water shifts these signatures and it also records the amount of energy that's being transferred from the object. Next slide. So these changes that we used for part of the historical part was we actually used a device which was called a tow chain, which we will look at in a later slide that actually describes the mechanism and the measure of how we did that. Next slide. Um, this is a slide that details a little bit more of what we understand of how the orbits and what wave particles operate under sea. When these wakes go, and if this was a lateral position and a ship was to go through, the first waves would have a certain length that would push the objects and to push the water away from the actual device or the ship. And then what would happen is it would disrupt the layers, which are called the mixed layers, which are underneath the sea and a water base to a specific level. So the moving objects would create the fluid that was essentially sharing the mechanism. Not only was it the signature of where the objects passed, but it could also let you know how long it would take for the wave base to start settling and to become the area that you could use to detect what direction the sub was going in or how big the, the wave was, I mean the wake, and to determine potentially even the signature. Next, next slide. So what happens is that based upon the orbits of the signatures, the blind spots, which were beneath the thermal layer, would be the areas where the submarines could actually hide to avoid detection from using uh, any form of an acoustical detection mechanism. And now what we can do is we can actually go into the area where we were now able to show what are the benefits of being able to use uh, the non-thermal, I mean, I'm sorry, the non-acoustical mechanism to try to detect the subs. Next slide. In this slide here, there's an area which is called the thermocline. And the thermocline is a blind, blind spot beneath the sea where if you were to evaluate what the water temperature was and you could see where the actual submarine is in this slide, you would be able to detect the propulsion and it would create a mix in the layer of the temperatures that were what was called the gradient temperature of where the actual sub was located by measuring where the sub was. And you could actually use this area in the thermocline to determine what type of sub it was. You could determine a size and even the class of the sub for up to four hours after that ship, I mean the submersible or sub has passed. Next slide. Um, outside of the ability, which gave us a more discrete way of identifying what type or size or class was the use of a thing called the Kelvin wake and the Bernoulli hump. And these were some of the mathematical processes that were created by uh, the ability to detect the how the fluid is deflected off of a submerged object. And you could actually determine the path of the motion, the disturbance, and how fast that the uh, submersible or the sub was actually moving. Next slide. Uh, 
Um, these are some examples based on what's called wake amplitude. And these were our first indications that we could detail some of the characteristic angles of how we could look at where they were from the models that were A, B, C, D, and F. A wake detection system were the sensors that could analyze the state of the water near a sub. And so as the um, way with much thermal radar and thermal energy was basically a way that you could determine how fast that these were going through the outer cusp and the inner cusp. And you could actually tell um, the speed and then by bringing the tow chain to different levels and different depths, we were able to get accurate depictions of what types of submarines were in our path. Next slide. So this is the specific picture where we would show that behind the ship, we would carry what was known as the tow chain, which was a tow body. And as it was measuring four waves and wakes, it would look for mixed levels and mixed signatures. Here in this example, if you were to take a look at the mode one, which was one of the samples about uh, 35% of the way to the left, you can see that the waves were relatively uh, static in its area, but then you could start detecting some amplification and some mixing in the layers from maybe the 50% point all the way to the 75%. So with these statistics, you could actually gauge and to determine what sensors and what levels of capability of an object that would be passing by, because if not, then you would have had mostly a static and not mixed layer. And then the ship would then be able to transmit information about what its findings were to other ships for greater levels of investigation to find out that if a sub was present in those areas. Next slide. So in this area, this is where we started talking a little bit about where you would have the ability to calibrate your data. As we were collecting the water spectrum of the passing objects, well, my specific role was to take the data as it came in and then to begin to calibrate it to make sure that all of the signatures could be reproduced or if we were able to find something that was of interest that could be considered to be an anomaly we would be able to uh, correct the calibrations of the equipment and the tow chains so that they could actually represent what type of sub and what was actually the signatures that we could use for greater levels of analysis. Next slide. So this is just one of the examples of how you could look at how a wake or how an object under the water would look like. And just to show how you could track, this is using actual dye to give a level of depiction of what the Bernoulli waves and what the, the lateral and the traverse wakes could look like so that we could detect this up. Next slide. So now we wanna talk a little bit more of what is the future of what's next for anti-submarine warfare. Uh, one of the things that we talked about as far as history repeating itself is that as sub countermeasures become more quiet, the ability for them to operate more stealthily, one of the things that they're starting to look at is how they're using different areas to identify trace chemicals that can be in the water, whether it is ions and changes from the nuclear emissions, even though they're, they're small, they can be other areas, as well as further development in heat and chemical sensors to being able to detect for longer periods of time whether sub has passed within these areas. Um, next slide. So in summary, submarines are always going to be an integral part of our nuclear deterrence. Um, science and countermeasures make stealth and submarine warfare ever more challenging for us. But 
as we continue to move forward, the fusion between signals processing and signals intelligence, we see that wake and wake detection systems are going to still be around as they have in the past to being able to be a more effective way for us in the future and that the history of signals intelligence and collections with sub warfare and anti sub warfare will continue to exist and continue to be a part not only of our history, but our current past as well as our future to defend our nation. So that's it for my slide deck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions from the from the audience? Um, if not, I, I would ask a question, uh, Darnell. Um, it was fascinating. Um, how how long have we been able to detect submarines um, this way? Was this something that we were using back, say, in World War II and in previous generations before we had nuclear capable submarines? Uh, not really. The advent of being able to do the ter the temperature sensing and those areas came around 1978 where they start first were starting to do pilots. It took about five years for them to start developing some of the tow chains and the thermistor rated capabilities. But the time that we actually started the live deployments was around 1979. So the period of where we actually began a lot of the field testing, I would say would be in the very early 80s. But we had immediate success in knowing that these were evolutionary ways to start having mechanisms of detecting subs and you didn't need to have a direct presence or uh, use sonar to being able to detect them. Thank you. OK. OK. Um, I still don't have any questions. <laughs> Uh, I would ask one of Mark, though, um, since I have questions I've written down myself. Um, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, Mark, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about more about why was the Sphinx um, considered um, a double duty, uh, as you as you talked about um, post, and was there any uh, was there any concern among the crew? Um, you know, since the Sphinx was part of the Liberty Pueblo <laughs> class um, that clearly had had, you know, had problems. You got on mute. Uh, let's see. Not letting us unmute you. Uh oh. Oh, yeah, the there we are. It doesn't appear until I click my mouse in the right area there. So, okay. have you got me now? Yep, yeah, we sure do. Okay, well, there were just two ships in this time period that were considered this type of arduous duty. One was oh. the Sphinx in the Gulf of Fonseca, and the other was the uh, Central Command command ship in the Persian Gulf. And each okay. of those had the same arrangement uh, approved by the CNO for one year tours and arduous duty. They both had the common characteristic that they were, were ships that sort of went around in circles in tropical waters. I don't know if that considered arduous duty. It's on a cruise ship, it's fine. Right. But the uh, I think the limited recreational opportunities for the Sphinx and the nature of the port calls. Uh, if you didn't speak Spanish, uh, port calls in many of these places in Central America were probably not as interesting as they might be in Singapore or Hawaii or something like that. So that's probably the arduous duty. I don't think that any of the people I talked to about the Sphinx really felt that they were sort of hung out there to the degree that the Liberty and the Pueblo were. And I personally, I talked to uh, a bunch of people about that, and they think that, well, in fact, my department head in Hawaii was the 
sing, singing officer in charge aboard the Liberty, and he was always firm, firmly convinced that uh, the attack on the Liberty was not a mistake. And the attack on the Pueblo obviously was not a mistake. And I think that the sailors on the Sphinx didn't feel that they were isolated to that degree. Uh, they had army helicopters dropping supplies. It was They were less than 100 miles from Sado Cano, where the uh, army had a large force of helicopters, including attack helicopters and perhaps even Air Force aircraft. They were basically supporting the government of El Salvador, who would in, uh, not want them to be disturbed because I suspect that that government was receiving support from the United States. So it wasn't as if they were far from nearby resources. Uh, so I don't think that they felt particularly nervous about their position and their uh, capabilities being uh, subject of undue attention from Nicaraguans or other forces. Thank you. All right, Gabe, are you on? I Yes, I am. OK, well, I have a question for you, too, um, since I guess I get to ask the questions. Um, fascinating uh, talk. Have you done oral histories um, with uh, some of the people that were there as uh, as the mission down in, in Texas, you know, trans. Transition Our oral. Yeah, yeah, good question. Our oral history program actually did interview one of the uh, commanders there. Um, so we have interviewed senior people, um, but also, of course, getting a mission brief and talking to other operators throughout the years, throughout my 40 years in the SIGIN community, and also from materials from our archive, we've been able to um, gauge a, a pretty good um, presentation if i if i might say so myself you know on on how everything developed into the modern cryptologic centers from just a little wideband effort here in san antonio yeah. all right thank you all right well i think that brings our um our presentation to a close i'd like to thank um gabe and mark and darnell for some fascinating discussions and um if you know you go away let me see and have oh okay wait a minute before we go anywhere i have two new questions um how is the temperature mixing induced by the toad array calculated out of the readings for a submarine the array itself is also causing mixing i believe that one is for darnell Yes, what happens is that the calibration of the tow chain, you have to basically build in and factor uh, the speed of the actual ship and the rate that it's being towed, as well as the depth and the weight of the tow chain as it's being dispersed. So those capabilities needed to be added into the original calibration to kind of uh, void out those temperatures and those readings of how they would be impacted as part of that tow chain. That's a great question. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone who attended. Um, just a uh, note that tomorrow morning uh, we will be starting at 8 a.m. Uh, with three uh, sessions. Um, so please join us then um, and we will have a full program for you. And again, thank you to all of our presenters. Have a good evening. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye.